Thank you, Professor. Please stay with us. Um, and uh, like, like you said, the, the, the tailwinds are no longer with us. Work needs to be done. So we go right away with, with the work. And I'm calling on Professor Louise Hölscher, Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development to chair the next panel. Thank you. Thank you very much and a warm welcome from my side as well. Might I ask my panel colleagues to join the two of us here. The air is be better on this side, so just come on and I make a short introduction to the, of those who have not been uh, at the lectern yet. With me, I have here on the panel, besides Professor Gonzalez Paramo and Hi, nice meeting you. Um, and uh, Mr. Holmes, um, to my left-hand side, um, Mr. Wilhelm Molterer, Vice President of the European Investment Bank. I might say the bank, the EBRD, is usually mixed up with, so I'm very happy that we are both on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you were appointed in 2011 as a vice president responsible for cohesion, and I think the bank itself I do not need to explain. Andreas Preuss, the next one on the left-hand side, Deutsche Börse AG, deputy chief executive officer, and with a strong focus on the Eurex, so on the more international um, uh, perspective of stock exchanges. Um, welcome on the panel as well. And just in time, uh, Dr. Berman, thank you very much for joining us. You uh, are um, Chief Investment Officer at the Deutsche Asset and Wealth Management and uh, represent the asset and wealth man management capabilities of Deutsche Bank Group in that, n I, I think we still can say, n quite new uh, setting. So um, before I go on with the discussion, I would like to thank you, the, say thank you to the organizers and to the panelists to be here with me. Perhaps one or two words about me. It's always um, dangerous to ask a university lecturer to chair a panel because uh, usually lecturers like to hear their, listen to their own voice. And uh, especially difficult it is for me because European Bank for Reconstruction and, and Development is working in some of those <laughs> markets that already have been addressed as emerging markets. So I try to bite on my tongue and not to present too much from my perspective and my um, yeah, point of view. Um, so, um, I think I do not need to introduce any more into the topic. Um, emerging markets, will they remain the growth engines? We heard two very good um, keynotes on this, one focusing on the development of the past, the other one and, and what it means for individual um, a business of um, uh, chart standard chartered. And um, on the other side, um, on the other side, the perspective on what might not next steps be. Um, so, as this is the setting for this uh, conference, um, I was asked to f to make up uh, a first quick check, yes or no question, and um, to make this first quick check where the positions are on the panel. Let's start with a question I'd like you to answer either with yes or no, and let me break the rules, or uh, maybe, but then I want to have an, an explanation to the question, are emerging markets still the growth engines? Perhaps, Mr. Holmes, may I ask you to start yeah. with the answer? Yes, no, or maybe, but then I want an I'll, want I'll an give you a yes, but. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so could you, could you work out, no, no, before we work out on the, on the butts, but I have that in mind, uh, okay. I, 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 there will be a question on that. I, Professor, I would very much uh, agree with him. Oh, uh, okay, yes, but. so I stay on my right hand side, Dr. Berman. I'm giving a clear yes. Okay, <laughs> so hopefully I have a no on my left hand side, otherwise we have the same problem as in the first panel. <laughs> there is nothing more boring than total agreement <laughs> on the panel. Herr Molterer, 
with yes, a with a question mark. With a question mark, okay. <laughs> so my, all maybe my this is the similar thing. <laughs> as <Pat. laughs> so all my hopes are on you, Mr. Coy. Um, I will have to disappoint your hopes. Um, <laughs> I give you a, a very unconditional yes. Oh, okay. So I think uh, as we have a lot of yeses, but with um, appendixes, let me say, uh, as I already said, I would like you to elaborate on the what's the but. Okay. Uh, well, I think in terms of the question, will it continue to be the growth engine? The but is it will continue to grow faster than the developed world, but mm -hmm. not at the same pace as we've been experiencing recently. So as I mentioned, in 2013, the developing markets contributed 70% of world growth. Mm. Last year was 61%, this year we think 54%. Partly that is China slowing a little bit, but partly that, as Jose said, partly is the US has done better and now growing at two and a half. Um, so, so we've got a counterbalance going on in the developed world and the developing, but there's no question to me in the medium long term, the developing world will continue to grow faster. Okay, uh, I had a, four, a short moment of hiccup when you mentioned the US in the same sentence with the emerging markets, but I think uh, I agree absolutely <laughs> with, the, with the, to the, the, the total answer. Yes, it balances at the moment. Mr. Professor... Yeah, yeah and just to complement what uh, was just uh, said, the projections of growth for, for these uh, emerging countries uh, based on the assumption that the trends would continue put them at 80% of global growth in the coming, I don't know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the contribution would be 80%, 20% in the, the, the developed world. But the, this is contingent on these countries facing the challenges I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So if not, we could see instability, we could see a reduction in growth as we see at the moment. Those countries having specialized in energy production, for instance, now they see demand going down and excess supply because they invested a lot. So. Uh, this is the but, but I think the trend, of course, is that they will mean more and more in the share of global production going forward, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any explanation on the clear answer, Dr. Verman? Yeah, I do think uh, for the, you know, emerging market country set, I said very much yes, but I do think emerging market set is today not homogeneous like yeah. what we really thought for 10 years ago, every you know, country is in the same country set and so on. Today is a very much differentiation needed. So the countries, you know, different countries are contributing today different to the global growth. But I do think one of the angle point in the global economy is that China decided to change more and more the model. Mm -hmm. That has impacting, you know, the global growth contribution very clear. But also I do think the emerging market growth was a very huge function of, you know, growth in the developed world. That means really, you know, in the Western world. And I do think as we are experiencing now the last years, the global growth is going down due to the developed world growth yeah. going down. It's also in resulting in more or less the contribution of emerging market is going down now. And this is what, what we have to discuss. And I think there's a clear <coughs> differentiation country by country, region by region is needed uh, today. If I may ask further, if you say country by country or region by region, are those countries, let me say, um, groupable? Could you make groups of countries? Yeah, no, I do think, look, beside the China, I mm -hmm. think China we will, might be talk some second, you know, how they're going to change the model. But I do think if you look now, India and Indonesia, one hand side. Other hand side, now Latin America, mm -hmm. like you know, Brazil, uh, takes countries like Venezuela. They are really stuck, you know? And the, because I think reforms are not going, progressing, all these things. For years ago, Brazil was a huge contributor to global growth and our ho hope was they will go uh, going to continue. But I do think there is some reform uh, you know, um, slackness in the economies in Latin America, and that is, you know, very negatively to global growth. While countries like India and Indonesia, it looks like they are doing their homework and contributing to growth. And in the country set, in the emerging market country set, there's really these both regions, Latin against Asia. You know, you have mm -hmm. to play, but also economic-wise, market-wise too. 
Okay, thank you very much. So uh, from the European perspective, uh, mostly the look doesn't go that far to other continents, but stays closer. Uh, Mr. Moltera, how is your perspective on this? Well, the reason, the reason why, I put, uh, why I put the question mark to the yes is, in principle, I fully agree they will grow faster in any case, mm -hmm. even if the differentiation <laughs> is going to be a bit, a bit mm -hmm. uh, let's say, a bit uh, diminished. First of all, I agree the differentiation amongst the emerging, the emerging markets is going to increase. And this is a key element for making the right assumption, mm -hmm. because we usually talked about, from the European perspective, about emerging, emerging markets. This is not the case anymore. Those are different markets with different conditions. Second issue, which is key, also from the investor side, volatility will, agree, it will increase. This is not a stable trend, what we expect mm -hmm. to see in the next 10 years. It's a volatile thing. Third, what we should not underestimate is the geopolitical situation, which is tricky one, which could impact the development seriously. We see this, and we should not underestimate the potential risk out of this. Fourth, which is on the positive side, what I find fascinating is that those countries are not just doing their internal business partially, but they are also going now to the global stage. Look what happens with the BRICS Bank. Look what happens with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. This is serious stuff. And we have to, we have to deal with this in a, positive, in a positive way. Those are partners. And I am absolutely happy that in the meantime, the reluctancy to cooperate with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is going to disappear. <laughs> it's the right decision. If we want to have them as driving engines, we have to accept them as equal partners. Thank you very much for this step to the cooperation of international financial yeah. institutions. It's always a bit dangerous to discuss this between EIB and EBRD because both have the E at the beginning of their names and there have been rumors a long time ago. But uh, cooperation helps us here and uh, some of the geopolitical issues you, you just touched on um, have shown that cooperation here really helps. Absolutely. Um, from the stock exchange perspective, what is that yes good for? Please allow me um, to open up by stating that Deutsche Börse Group really is way more than a stock exchange. Yes. Um, <laughs> I want you to give um, a bit of yeah, angle. It's, 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 it's in, in a way relevant for what I'm going to, to, to mention later on. We are a globally acting uh, exchange infrastructure service provider that, by the way, not only in the derivatives arena is truly globally focused. Um, and the Frankfurt audience here should not take it badly. My chairman of the Exchange Council uh, on the cash market side is, is, is used to, to hearing this. Um, Frankfurt as a financial marketplace uh, is important in Germany. Uh, in the derivatives world, it is absolutely irrelevant where you are. Um, you just need to be relatively close to high-speed uh, glass fiber. Um, <laughs> the, answer, my, the answer that you uh, asked me to provide, I will lean a little bit on a February 2015 PwC forecast. It states along the following lines. In 2050, China will be the largest economy in the world, followed by the United States as number two, India number three, Indonesia four, and Brazil five. In other words, and the weakness of my argument maybe is that I give credence to a PwC um, uh, forecast here for, for the sake of my today's argument. Um, within less than four decades, four of the five top economies in the world will be what we consider emerging markets today. Um, now we can go into, there are many different definitions of uh, what emerging markets are from 
the BRICS definition coined by Goldman Sachs to the next 11 also, I believe, uh, coined by Goldman Sachs. CIVITS comes, I think, from HSBC. E7 comes by, is, is coined by, T, by PwC. Uh, E7, if this, is, if this was not only news to me, is China, India, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey. Now, admittedly, it is very difficult to make um, clear forecasts, at least for us as, as an infrastructure service provider who is positioning himself globally and therefore also very strongly in Asia. If I look at the um, growth rate in China uh, in 2014, we heard it, it's slightly down from 7.5 to 7%. Um, but if you just think that through, at a rate of 7%, China's economy will double in size in the next decade. Um, that means each year in China, new economic activity is added that is larger than the entire economy of countries such as Sweden or Switzerland. The rise of emerging markets, especially in Asia, um, is also visible in the capital market. In 1998, Asia accounted for about 4% of the value of global stock trading. In 2012, that number had uh, gone up to roughly 20%. And in contrast, Europe had dropped in the same, sp in the same uh, time frame from 21 to 16. Now, to, f to finish off my argument, to also put a, a, a dampening component onto it, in the late 80s, I think there were many people who forecast that um, Japan had, was on an inevitable pass to um, global number one. Um, and we all know how that has uh, come out. Uh, so Deutsche Börse Group um, is one of the two market or probably one of the two very Asian-focused market um, participants on this panel. Deutsche Börse Group has a very strong focus on Asia. Growth is coming from Asia, not only in the next three to five years, I predict in the next 15 to 20. Thank you very much. The question that um, uh, remains in my mind is if we have figured out who and where the engine is, the question is do, how do we get that power on the street in Europe from the Frankfurt perspective? May I just ask that as an add-on on your statement, Mr. Paul? Um, so you would like me to, uh, to give a short <laughs> I, 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 I will announce it officially if it is a yes or no answer. Yes so or no you can, answer. You can a yes or no answer. No, no, you can Im t use more than one word. How can, we, how can we transfer, if we have growth engines in the mentioned market, how can we transfer the growth to, to Europe, or as this is called the Frankfurt Finance Summit, to Frankfurt? I don't believe that there is one way. Uh, to accomplishing this. Uh, I think this uh, will already widely vary from industry sector to industry sector. Um, uh, what comes first to my mind is I would give you a totally different answer for the so-called real, meaning producing economy, yes, yes. or for the financial service sector, which somewhere we represent. Um, in a financial services sector, um, there, I believe, is no clear answer. It begins actually already with a problem, or not with a problem, with a positive challenge, that there is no such thing as Asia. Um, my younger staff so, sort of figured that out once they managed to sit on an airplane from Singapore eight to nine hours in one direction and seven to eight in the other, and they are still in, in Asia. Um, Asia is highly fragmented mm -hmm. as, as markets. We work on, in some areas of our business, seven, in others, nine. I, I give that openly away. But that is already a lot. So 
Um, just to, to disappointing your request for a clear answer. Uh, I believe um, it really depends on the market you're looking at from the industry that you're representing, mm. and you might and you will come up with very widely varying replies. Mm. Mm. I see a general nodding. I do think. Uh, I do think. Uh, how to translate or uh, to bring this momentum dynamic into Fra you know, Frankfurt or Euro you know, European economies? That, that was your question, is that right? Yeah. yeah. I do think we are seeing every day. I want to say that investor, you, you know, German stocks as highly depend on, for example, Asian markets. Look, emerging market was more or less last 20 years we use as our global workbench. Mm -hmm. But today is not only workbench for us, is demand markets. You know, German automobile, you know, industry is highly depend on Chinese automobile sector. Mm -hmm. You know, the demand. We are not only producing there, yeah. mm -hmm. but we are already, you know, we our, you know, our success of our automobile sector is massively depends on that, mm -hmm. on this, you know, in the Asian economies. So the global growth is translated already, mm. you know, into local growth. I think why is Germany not felt in 2000 or after 2008 we came strongly out? It was exactly the connection of Germany to China. And I have to say that even Chinese growth numbers came dramatically down from 10, last 10 years from 14%. Today might be, we are forecasting for this year 6.8%. The ten years, the last ten years, the lowest growth rate, but this is much. You have to look at, and I think uh, Mr. Uh, Price has put that in right in context. Again, the 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 the, the, the Chinese growth is going to grow 2017 the size of Spain. I'm not going to Sweden or to s small Switzerland. Spain, the fourth biggest Euroland. So. This is the things what we have to put in a, uh, in, a con uh, in, a, in a context. And I do think there's a lot of risk in China. I have to say that. But the growth is already here to say that. In Frankfurt, we can smell it. We mm. can see it. We are transforming already, are by the way, uh, into uh, financial market performance. Mr. Holmes. Yeah, I think uh, I agree a lot of it's going on anyway. The private sector sort of gets it, but in answer to your question, what, what can we do more? I think I come back to making sure we've got the right free trade agreements in place. Mm -hmm. so, so free trade agreements, I think, are, are very important. Capital flow is really important. I mentioned the, the uh, opportunity in Africa for infrastructure companies, power companies, telecommunication companies. I mean... You know, there's 930 million people in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. 600 million of them don't have electricity. So, so in terms of unlocking, you know, and Africa's full of commodities, full of people, it, it just needs some investment and power. And then I think Germany can really benefit from that mm -hmm. by capitalizing on the trade flows. But, but I think putting some investment in some of these countries is pretty important. Mm -hmm. What about yeah, Latin America know, I, going through the continent? I think the, the, this boils down to, to focusing very much on keeping the lead on what drives growth, which is basically innovation, trade, and investment. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't agree more. I mean, the things we do best uh, will bring growth to us. If you could do good retail banking, you seize the market eh, because you do things better than anyone. If you understand that the digital revolution is also at the doorsteps of the banks, you should be proactive there. And then you would be at the forefront of social inclusion in developing countries. And we have a lot of ex experience, for instance, in Mexico and, mm -hmm. and, and the like, with the number one bank there. Um, so, and trade, I, I couldn't agree more. So, but trade means, of course, understanding that you sell, if you sell cheaper or you sell more sophistication or you go to niches, but also uh, rule of law is there. So trade on a... Uh, on the basis that we understand better. And this is why it's so important, the tip, huh? by the way. Because to the extent that the US and Europe remain 40% of world GDP, they can set, they can set the template for the trade in the times to come. 
Otherwise, maybe trade would be subject to the uh, comes and goes uh, associated to the new players, which are not sharing entirely our philosophy and our approach as regards property rights, mm -hmm. respect of uh, uh, the inventions and, 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 and so on. So, um, being obsessed on keeping the lead in trade, innovation, and investment. Thank you. So. Um, I haven't forgotten you. Um, to, to sum up the four answers so far, uh, if the emerging markets manage to maintain their growth, we have the tools in place and know how to transfer uh, that growth to uh, um, the uh, Western European or the Western region. But if we didn't have, if we would not have those geopolitical problems at the moment, Mr. Moldera. Well. Um I think uh, it, the situation is as it is uh, from today, which is not uh, an explanation that uh, this situation will remain for the next decade. But it is a problem we will face, and those volatility is, an, is a factor in any case, what we have to take into account. The second thing is, of course, in Europe, sometimes I have the impression, I fully agree with the importance to support the importance of trade, but sometimes I do have the impression we are, we are working under the assumption that this is one-way communication. Mm -hmm. If you want to be successful, it is in any case a two-way communication. That means we have to be ready also to open our markets, which, by the way, is not for the worse for Europe. And if you go for that, you have to accept them as partners, as I said, uh, acting on a level playing field. And this is part of the problem of the famous TTIP. We are not, we are not really convinced and are not really convincing our, our people that this is in our best interest to go for that, even if we are challenged by them. And this is, by the way, also a rather positive effect which we should not underestimate for the European, for the European perspective. They are potentially not just drivers for growth, they are potentially also additional drivers for structural reforms, what we have, what we have to do, because they gave us on some, of, on some sectors, you mentioned innovation. What we are lacking in Europe is innovation ability and innovation capacity. Look what happens in the emerging market. We can learn from them, as simple as that. And if we go for that, that's, real, that's really a value we can, we can gain. It's not just to export, it's also to import Mm -hmm. It's also to input. And part of the exercise, what we should and what we can do is to give them to the best extent possible advice on the structural, on the structural reforms necessary. Even Europe is not the best example in the world on structural reforms. We are, not, we are not in the lead. But on certain sectors, I think we can offer, we can offer something. On education, for instance, on vocational training, we can offer something to the world because skilled people is one of the, one of the bottlenecks potentially in, mm. those, in those countries, where Europe, for instance, or part of Europe with, for instance, voc vocational training can offer something. Thank you very much. So if both sides can learn from each other and it's not a one-way street, the question then is, and now this is, I announce it as the second yes or no question. Um, uh, as we've seen in the discussion, we cannot give a general answer on the question whether emerging markets still are the growth engines. It is a but or a depends or a question mark. So if there is a uh, reason, or there must obviously be a reason, why those, at least some of those emerging markets are not still the growth engines. It seems they haven't done their homework so far. It might be they haven't made their structural reforms. And having said this, my second yes or no question is, have emerging markets made a proper use of structural reforms? And I know that this is a very broad question, so whatever so structural reforms can be uh, a broad range of things. So uh, asking this question, I would uh, um, add to ask for an example. Mr. Holmes, may I start with you? Sure. Uh, and again, I think a point we've made many times is it's difficult to lump the developing economies into one bucket. Yes. They, they all have different challenges and they've all addressed them in different ways. So I think it's pretty dangerous to sit here in judgment 
on, on various economies, and I think you have to look at how far they've come, but by and large, I think they've done a pretty good job, mm. um, particularly in Latin America after the debt crisis in the 80s, and in Asia after the crisis uh, in the 90s, um, of putting in some, some good reforms. And again, it varies from market to market, but um, you know, arguably Europe hasn't done as much reforming as it should have done as well. So I don't think <laughs> I'm comfortable sitting here um, <laughs> wh when I look at what should have happened across Europe since the financial crisis in Europe six years ago, <laughs> and what has actually happened, yeah. and we're putting a monetary policy band-aid on a fiscal problem. Fair, so, um, so, so anyway, in terms of examples though, I mean, I, I gotta pick out Singapore, which has just done an incredible job over the last 40 years, uh, and it is arguably no longer an emerging market. It's a, it's a fully developed, highly functioning, very efficient marketplace that, that's, if you could replicate that model and slot it in some other countries, I think, I think the world would be a better place. I think the other way, y you have to pick places like Venezuela, yeah. um, Russia, I think, really hasn't hasn't done enough, and and some so some of the oil oil rich countries, they didn't have the same need in a sense because they could pump oil out of the ground, and that was sort of good enough. But really, that isn't good enough to build a sustainable economy. So I think, to some extent, oil rich countries have afforded to be a little lazy. Those without that um, have probably done more. Mm -hmm. But overall, compared to what we're doing now, I think it's a pretty good story. Thank you very much. I won't make a comment on short answers and men versus women. <laughs> um, have emerging markets made a proper use of structural reforms? And what could be an example for your answer? Some of them have, some of them haven't. I give you just four countries uh, which are not so far away as an example. This is Egypt. This is Ukraine, this is Turkey, and this is Poland. In 1990, the starting point for the mm. four economies on GDP per capita was rather similar. All were around the five to seven thousand <coughs> uh, US dollar per, per capita. <coughs> if you look where they are now, it is, of course, uh, Ukraine started with around seven thousand uh, US dollar per, per capita, and now it's again back to seven thousand. If you look, for instance, uh, for Egypt, Egypt started with some 4,000, and it's now roughly around 9,000 mm -hmm. US dollar per capita. If you look for Poland, for instance, they, they started with 7,000 US dollar, and they are now around 25,000 US dollar per capita. And if you look for Turkey, they started with 7,500, 7, and they are now by around about 20,000 US dollar per capita. And if you look into detail, for Poland, for sure, this was the market orientation, the strong will of the government to change, and the EU was the driver because association and, and the later stage of accession <laughs> was the driver. For Turkey, in a, in a certain similarity, also the EU perspective was the driver of these reforms. Mm. And look at the others. And here you see, you do have a lot of potential internally for restructuring in towards market orientation, fiscal discipline, a sound legal system, fighting corruption. We should not call this informality, we should call it corruption because it is corruption which, uh, which is, uh, what is what is about. It's the question of privatization, for instance. In a lot of those economies, there is still room for, 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 for privatization. It's the support of the SME, the small and medium-sized uh, enterprises are also in those regions the long-term backbone, the strong backbone of a diversified economy. It's the infrastructure and it's education that was mentioned and there are uh, certain other things. What the European Union can do is, I think, really to give the perspective, the positive perspective on this, on this reform path based on our good experience but also based on the failures we did. But Reform is what counts. Market is, of course, then the result in the market position. And you see on, this, uh, on these four examples, where's the difference? Thank you. So, Professor Gonzalez-Paramo, what is your view 
about the structural reforms of mm. emerging markets. I heard so far they've done a pretty good job and they have pretty much to do left. Yeah. What's your no, pretty answer? Uh, I think it's exactly that. So I couldn't agree more with uh, what was said at this moment. They have done a lot and this explains why they withstood so well the impact of the financial crisis, among other things. Yeah. Uh, w you have seen many examples that show that they have understood. Remember Alan Garcia, the, the president of Peru, in his first mandate and in his second mandate? It's two different persons. Huh? Or when Ojanta Omala came on the back of a populist program, but the first thing he had to do was to confirm the central bank governor, and only then markets calmed down. And now Peru uh, continues to have a very uh, good spell of growth. So I think uh, reforms as it has property rights, institutions uh, in place, independent central banks. Um, I agree that uh, informality is corruption, but it's, I would say, small-scale corruption in the sense that I was talking. So workers that are completely uh, excluded from paying social security yeah. contributions, they are not covered by pensions. You see, in Mexico, after the reforms they approved in, in, in the last couple of years, informality has gone down four points. Mm -hmm as presented their labor force. So this is also showing an understanding how things work. They have been not lucky enough because oil prices have gone down at the time they opened up a Temex to, to external investors, but this will pay in the long term. There is no question that this is the way to go. So I couldn't agree more with uh, what uh, was said. Looking to my left-hand side, what would be your answer, Mr. Paul? Here you get a yes and no. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, the explanation for this uh, yes and no answer, <coughs> some of the points have already been mentioned. I would uh, point out that, um, generally speaking, many of the emerging economies have um, significantly reduced their dependencies on uh, foreign currency debt, have cleaned up their public finances and have uh, built up um, big foreign reserves. It has also been uh, covered that they are today probably less exposed to external shocks than they were in the 90s. And many of the countries focused on, on progress have made at least first generation reforms. Um, so floating exchange rates, better regulated banking. I believe that the dividing line between those who are fast progressing and those who will take much longer actually is a combination of corruption, red tape, and let me generalize it as ethnic conflicts. Um, if you just take, for example, um, India, and here I should probably mention that maybe the reliability of the legal system is a crucial aspect, uh, which I would like to add. And when I speak, want to speak about India, here you have a very good example for very good legal system, not only in theory, I mean, it's modeled after the, the British legal system. Um, and yet, if I had to today decide which of the countries, China or India, from a today's perspective in five years' time, have progressed faster? It would a, be a split-second answer that it is China. And the unfortunate from an Indian point of view is, as long as you have a uh, pretty uh, inseparable mixture of um, corruption levels and red tape, it is very problematic to really uh, encounter focus growth. Um, and when we are, as a market practi uh, practitioner, we are actively involved in, in uh, uh, India. We have a uh, partnership with the Bombay Stock Exchange. They are a very uh, high-tech organization. Um, I draw my hat to the uh, quality of everything that they do, and yet they have to do it in an environment 
in which um, the development of, for example, required further development of uh, regulation on um, stipulations re necessary for doing their business is extremely slow. Thank you. So um, having two big counterparts with totally different development, um, like um, India and China, how I understood you, Dr. Wurman, you, you um, focused in your previous statement on the Asian um, sector in general. What would your on answer be? What structural reforms are still lacking there? Mm. I, I would overall, I would say yes, but uh, I hate to not to give a clear answer. But I do think that, again, also there, much more we have to expect and have to come, mm. structural changes. This is at the very beginning. Think about that, the last 25 years, more or less for the, you know, the majority of the emerging markets, they are starting you know, to show some real life and contribution to the world economy. And again, countries like, and I want to mention that, especially in Asia, as I started my career, we talk, I have spent the time in the university, the tiger states in Asia. No? Mm. And uh, they are now, look, um, for example, today Thailand and Korea, I think we can't, might be talk about emerging markets anymore. Yes. One of the colleagues said already. So they have high standards, but I think might be not the same understanding of standards like in Western economies. And that's the one thing we have to also understand as a Western you know, uh, economy grown people, the standards are not the same and might be we are not going to converge that. Uh, they are not con converged to our standards fully. But I think the Poland case, I fully agree with that. Poland case is a very clear storyline. And I have to say that 1999, uh, Mr. Waltra, Poland was totally you know, uh, in a crisis. Absolutely. And I do think um, the European governance structures, what they have implemented in the economy, mm. also the thinking to how to drive structural changes that has really had their own dynamics and create the prosperity, what we can see there. On the other hand side, and I think you asked me the question in, in, in Asia, I am seeing the things, how, you know, improving from the macro level first. Might be that's the sake of, you know, it might be the investor's perspective always. If I look now the current account and our fiscal deficits, how that uh, going to change in India and, uh, and, and, and also in Indonesia, they are willing to take now the room that you know they are energy consumer countries, that the low you know energy uh, you know uh, energy prices to use for reforms, Re reducing this you know uh, the wrong uh, you know resource allocation, for example, subsidizing energy. All these t steps they are undertaking to to make their uh, external and internal balances or uh, external uh, imbalances to balance. Good sign, in my opinion, from the Polynesian standpoint. That is in some Western economies we have to ask. You know, we have our own problems mm. if you look at some Southeast uh, European countries. So from this standpoint, I would say Asia is willing to do much more reforms. And that's a one important factor. The, in the economies, there is new forces are going to uh, emerge because mm. the middle class oh. in these countries are going to develop. Mm -hmm. mm. If you look for 20 years ago, there was a fraction, there was a hand, six, five to six percent middle class. And I do think there's many reports there that next years we can see a middle class of 25 percent in the to total population. Mm. And this is driving, they are driving their own agenda. You know, the yeah. structural reform agenda. This is exactly what I'm missing in Brazil. I've been in Brazil uh, uh, shortly, and mm -hmm. I have to say that regulated prices, you know, and all the, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the government uh, in, you know, interventions disrupting the fantastic trend what we have seen, and that was an unbelievable story. At the time, the Lula came into the power. We said, oh, thank, you know, hopefully Brazil will not, you know, implode, but that was a completely different, but Rousseff has might, you know, change to a completely other extreme, and this non-reform program led today fantastic country like Brazil stuck 
in a hole, and it might be uh, she put uh, you know, really Brazil under risk for next years if she's not going to change. Mm -hmm. So there is really great examples for different differentiation, and this is, uh, in my opinion, this is the two regions or two big yeah. countries. Thank you very much. So if if, if I uh, try to get the the different perspectives together, it more or less focuses on if you help, and saying that from a German perspective, where the Mittelstand is the back, seen as the backbone of, the, yeah. of our economy, whatever you do, so the sum summary would be, whatever you do, try to, help, try to choose reforms, try to choose, choose tools that help the middle class development. Yeah. Would that be? And let me say an overarching principle that might bring together the different aspects of reform that have been discussed, not only the whole day today, but also yesterday evening at the, uh, in, at the dinner. If, if you look to the, to the success story in Europe, I think it's, it's, it's both the middle class and the middle stand. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And uh, what concerns me, for instance, in Russia, Beyond all these uh, this troubles on the, on the growth perspective, on the capital outflow, on the rubble uh, development, on the oil price, that my friends in Russia are telling me that the middle class is disappearing again. Mm. And this is the real thing what, what concerns me, because middle class always is a stabilizer mm. for a society and for a sustainable development in a society. Therefore, I think we should take into account also when we talk about our, our joint efforts uh, to, to, to see this as one of the key elements simply also to incentivize governments in this direction. Because I have the impression in some of the countries still the question of SMEs is an unknown territory. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are talking about microfinancing, which is okay, mm -hmm. it's good. But the question of the venture capital market, the startup, the startup, startup market, the classical uh, SME, SME business, the mid caps, what we do see, I think there is room for improvement because this goes hand in hand with the development of the middle class as a stabilizing factor. Thank you very much. The moderation guidelines tell me that I should end with a sentence to be completed by the panelists. And after the discussion we had in the past uh, 40 minutes, I have, sorry for that, changed my first idea of a sentence to be completed. Because what I wondered about in the past minutes was we're always talking about the emerging markets and the developed markets. But if I say, look at the, at the verb to emerge, so after emerging should come having emerged, being emerged. So what's the difference between an emerged and a developed country? Question mark. Or differently, so, uh, no, that's more uh, philosophical. Where is the borderline from an emerging market to an emerged or developed market? What's the... What can we help to help in that gray zone? What can we do? <laughs> Let me be very, very, very <laughs> politically incorrect. Uh, you need some track records being emerged, which means having given proof that you respect uh, uh, in, earn, uh, in, uh, in earnest the uh, property rights, openness of trade, democratic institutions, trade, uh, um, and all that leads to prosperity. And of course, middle classes are a byproduct of, of this. I, I wouldn't focus on creating a middle okay. class uh, artificially. Yeah. I think middle classes emerge where there's prosperity and they consolidate it. So it's a good thing to see middle classes uh, uh, increasing in numbers in all these emerging uh, markets because they are a stabilizing force, as was said. Uh, and innovation comes from middle classes as well. So in, in that sense, I think they need some track record being at that stage uh, in order to consolidate the stage at, at, at which they are. Okay, thank you, Dr. Berman. The borderline between emerging and emerged is? I want to be poker to you. And I fully <laughs> agree, uh, <laughs> Professor Gonzalez Paramo, uh, with your assessment. Let me say that very broadly. I have the feeling that the West, you know, developed world are uh, engaged on distribution of wealth, distribution mm -hmm. policy of wealth, while emerging market countries are still want to grow their wealth. So mm -hmm. that means they are really still 
doing everything for growth, even we don't agree that is all our norms. Mm. So this is the key differentiation and might be the, no, you know, what we have to you know, come back in the developed world. If we're doing this policy and continue this policy, we will lose our contributions to the you know, uh, in a world market mm. or our market share in the world market. And I do think, look, today I'm still thinking and I'm going one step forward. I'm not anymore. I think the sovereign countries are important, but today if you look, the world economy is driven by global companies mm -hmm. most of the time. You know, today if you look now, the, all the global companies in the US, Europe, in Asia, they're acting already as a one, you know, world economy. They are using all the, you know, uh, elements what is profitable mm. or not profitable, favor of them. And this is, in my opinion, in a further differentiation. Okay, thank you. Mr. Poise, the borderline between emerging and emerged is and can be crossed by? I believe that that borderline really is, um, is fuzzy. There's no, it, I don't think there is a clear borderline. Um, I believe that one indicator for the degree of already accomplished development is the maturity level of the financial infrastructure um, in any given market. So the, mm, the development, the completeness of the transmission belt between the real economy and um, the global financial marketplace. Thank you. Mr. Moldera. First of all, this borderline is hopefully disappearing because mm. that's what it's all about. Mm. Second, I think uh, there are beyond economic figures, there are categories or criteria mentioned I fully support. The middle class, for instance, is one of these elements as this is part of this, let's say, stabilization towards, towards democracy. My last remark would be uh, coming back a bit to the European uh, Union's role. If Europe wants to play a global role, Europe has to take global responsibility. This is for sure. And sometimes my impression is this, this orientation just to our internal troubles is of course the biggest threat for the European global responsibility. Okay. And therefore, for instance, for EIB, we fight hard that also in the future our shareholders agree that we can do 10% of our business outside of EU. Mm. We do 150 partner countries in, in the world, which is key. I was just uh, visiting Armenia yesterday and I saw how important it is to cooperate with other IFIs to give them certain, let's say, uh, impressions where you can go, where you should go. Question of conditionality, for instance, is in the meantime a positive thing from their side. It's not seen as a burden anymore. No, it's seen as an opportunity. I think this we have to work on. Thank you very much. Last but not least. Uh, I think the, the technical definition is probably GDP per mm. capita. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I better put that but out there. This, just was, not, this uh, was not asking for ho homework so, to me. <laughs> um, and it's pretty obvious if it's less than a thousand, yeah. it's yeah. developing. If it's over twenty thousand, it's yeah. developed. But I mean, I think there's other sort of attributes, yes. and, uh, and uh, I don't think it's a it's a hard line. But I, I think one other thing we should recognise is in the developing world is is the entitlement we all feel mm. to pensions, medical care, etc. Uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, I think, you know, here in Europe, people want to work 33 hours a week. Mm. In much of Asia, they want to work 33 hours a day. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I think um, there's other aspects of developed versus developing. I some are good, some aren't good. But, but ultimately, I think it is down to economic growth potential. And if you've got a low GDP per capita growth, then the potential to increase it is just great. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for this broad elaboration on the short last sentence. Um, I think at least in one point we all agree that 
none of the emerging countries will manage the problem of working th 33 hours per day. And if we should, if they manage to do that, we should find as soon as possible a transfer tool to bring it to our area as well. Thank you very much to all you on the panel and for your patience in the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.